So good morning, Mr. Raftery. Ryan, good morning to you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much, sir. So um, the guest today is Mr. Tom Raftery. He's the Global VP Futurist and Innovation Evangelist at SAP. Um, that is definitely where I wanted to start. I wanted to ask you actually, um, what is a futurist? Because I'm trying to see that it's going to inform uh, quite well your tremendously green worldview um, and optimistic as well. Sure, yeah. So um, futurist, as the name implies, is someone who kind of, you know, says what's going to happen sometime in the future. Um, I've always been kind of that way. I'm a bit of a news junkie, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm always, you know, reading news. I'm always looking at news sites. I'm always downloading, getting newsletters, anything at all. I'm a complete addict or complete junkie for, for news. Mm -hmm. All, always have been. Uh, always like anything that's new and shiny, um, but ADD that way. Sure. You were saying about being a news junkie. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very, and always have been, uh, very ADD, um, you know, and so because I kind of tend to like things that are new and shiny, I gravitated in university towards science and became a biologist. And uh, while I was doing my postgrad in biology, I was studying for a PhD in um, biological control mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I got distracted because ADD by technology, because that was the new and shiny then, and this was the early 90s. Sure. And so I chased that down, really loved it, set up a software company, uh, ran that from 95 through to 2002, merged with another company, and we were doing real cutting edge stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it was always, I mean, it was bleeding edge stuff. I mean, we wrote the first mobile phone game in Ireland and sold it to the uh, phone company, the, the incumbent phone company at the time, Aircell, you know, that kind of bleeding edge stuff. Um, and so I, I, I've always been kind of, you know, out there at the bleeding edge. I set up a social media consultancy company in 2004, for example, ran that through to 2008. Yeah, very early. Uh, you know, yeah. It's, so yeah, really early stuff. Uh, and uh, so I, I've always been out there at the mm -hmm. edge because, you know, it, it's the stuff that interests me with stuff where change is happening. Yeah. Uh, and I, because I'm such a news junkie and, and I have a reasonably good memory, I remember, you know, what's happened in the past. I, I see where we are now and I can start drawing plot lines and go, OK, well, if this happened five years ago, 10 years ago, and this is where we've gotten to today, well, obviously we're going to be over there in a few years time. So, you know, it, it, it made sense to kind of, you know, and I'm, I'm always kind of looking towards the future anyway. So uh, I just incorporated what I do into my job title. Yeah and called myself a futurist and it is that I'm, I'm i'm very much looking at the spaces where there's lots of disruption happening and saying well obviously this is what's happened so this is where it's going because that's that's what makes the total sense mm -hmm. that's the logical outcome of where things are going there's two really interesting things um that i want to take uh, what you just said so first of all is kind of we all have access to the same information right um and then the question i don't think so as in, yes, we do ha all have access to the same information, theoretically, but do we all consume the same information? Mm. Uh, very likely not. No, of course, that's what I was um, going to get to. While we all have access okay. to the same um, information, whether, yeah. like you said, it's a plethora of newsletters or perhaps even SAP have like internal industry reports that might be more privy to the insiders, but nonetheless, it's still on the whole accessible to everyone. You, you, know, you can tune into the McKinsey um, and Company podcast, which is going to give you as legit a rundown of an industry as really anyone else is going to. Uh, but then it comes mm -hmm. down to the consumption of it, as you, as you rightly say. Um, you mentioned that you have a really good memory and that's maybe a good way that you can sort of unconsciously tie in maybe rhyming events that are happening, perhaps something like that's going on, but something I, yeah. oh no, you go on, please. I, 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 I see patterns, I guess, is, is what I get to. I mean, I, I, I have a reasonably good memory for some things. I have a terrible memory for names on the other okay. hand, Fred. So, you know, um, the, 
but some some details and numbers and things of like that I, I I remember very well. I you know I can I can recite phone numbers mm-hmm. from when I was a kid mm-hmm. and car registrations of my my dad and my neighbors from when yeah. I was a kid. You know well, things like that, stupid things which make no sense to remember. Sure. But because because I can remember lots of numbers and, and put them in context, I can you know can remember the amount of new energy that was brought on in wind in 2019 in China and things like mm-hmm. that. You know, again. Uh, who cares? But on the other hand, you know, it, it, it's handy in some respects. You know what I, I suspect it does as well? It kind of bleeds into the uh, sort of classically stereotypical Irish storytelling. You know, the fact that you can lean on legitimate facts, it adds to someone's ability to orate. I mean, exponentially, that's a throwaway way, but it, it like is significantly better. Um, and that's something also, which obviously I really am trying to tee you up for here. I'd love <laughs> for you to, um, just give me your worldview, lay it out as I'm sure you've done many times before, but I, I do intentionally want to keep it open so you can, uh, take it where you will, because, uh, something that also I'm going to get to later into the chat is this, uh, idea that how can we predict a future of infinite possibilities based on a finite experiences of the past, you know, which is a bit trite, obviously, because history does rhyme and there is cycles and there is sort of predictability in things. But nonetheless, I do heavily subscribe to the notion that, uh, that prediction is rather futile. Doesn't mean it's not a worthwhile pursuit because it's absolutely a worthwhile pursuit, but just the, um, uh, you know, um, putting, significant capital in one basket to sort of discount what the other basket might be able to do to you. I, um, yeah, I just, I like to question. So I'll lead into the, into the worldview with this. So the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones and it is definitely going, well, definitely, it is most likely going to be the case that the, uh, oil age doesn't run out because we run out of oil. BP estimate that we have over 1.5 trillion barrels of crude um, on standby, right? It, it's already come out of the ground that the carbon's been extracted already. Um, and you know, they predict 50 years, this could last Massa Menos. Who's to say, I would like to throw 20 to 50% variability in that number who really knows, but to lead into you, to give us the worldview, how can we explain why we still have a thriving oil industry? <laughs> Good question, and I, I love that quote as well. The the oil, or sorry, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone, and the Oil Age similarly will end long before we run out of oil. That's a quote from Sheikh Yamani, the OPEC oil minister from the nineteen eighties, who unfortunately died quite recently. Uh, no, he lived to be a grand old age, so sure. you know, good 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 for him. Um, it's it's a great quote, and. Uh, there are a number of things to consider and to kind of parse going through that. The oil age is over and it's not over uh, because people have come to this massive climactic uh, realization. That's part of it, uh, but it's not the major part of it. The oil age is over because renewables are coming of age. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, economically speaking. It's now uh, far cheaper to generate electricity using solar or wind than it is by burning oil or burning coal. And in most cases, I say most cases, most cases burning gas. I say most cases because um, renewables, uh, their price depends on their latitude. Uh, So what I mean by that is um, where the sun shines most, solar energy is cheapest. So, you know, it's cheapest to produce solar energy uh, near the equator and it gets more expensive as you head towards the poles. Mm. And wind is not dissimilar, uh, but it it is it is more variable. Uh, You know, it's actually great near coastlines, for example, whether you're near near the equator or not. Uh, And it's great where you get land masses coming together. So, you know, there's fantastic wind resources here in the south of Spain. Um, You mentioned I'm Irish. I I happen to live in the south of Spain. There's a place called Tarifa near Cadiz, 
which is famous for kite surfing because it has incredible winds. And why is that? That's because the south of Spain meets North Africa and you get a fantastic, you know, exchange of wind between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean right there. So phenomenal wind resources. But I, I digress. <clears throat> Solar and wind are now cheaper in almost every location mm -hmm. than gas, which is the cheapest form of fossil fuel energy there is today. Um, I was talking to executives from DIWA, who are the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, and they told me it costs them nine cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity by burning gas, which is 95% of their uh, production now, but that's falling. Uh, it costs in that region, it costs 1.2 cent per kilowatt hour to generate electricity from solar. Wow. So you can see right there, yeah. the, the economic case for gas is dead. On the equator. Yeah, but that that is moving north okay. and south. It's moving away because uh, the cost of solar has fallen something like eighty nine percent in the last ten years, and it 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 call, it's following what's called the Swanson effect. The Swanson effect is like Moore's law, but for solar. And what the Swanson effect says is that uh, the price of solar energy drops twenty percent for every doubling of installed capacity. So this is a beautiful, virtuous circle. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, when the price falls, it becomes more attractive to more people, more of it gets rolled out, so the price falls, so it becomes more attractive to more people, so more of it gets rolled out, and so on and so on and so on. It's, it's lovely circular. And mm -hmm. that has happened since the 70s and continues to happen today. The price keeps falling year on year on year on year, so it becomes more attractive. and. Then, then you get economies of scale, the, the learning curve, price falling even more, and so on and so on. And the same has happened for wind. Not to the same extent, as I said, it was about 89% in the last 10 years for solar. It's about 50% for wind. But wind is picking up in pace mm -hmm. in, in terms of the reduction in cost. And we're seeing massive offshore wind parks now being built, you know, in the UK, in off Denmark, you know, the Baltics, uh, off the US coast now it's starting. They're a little late to the party, but, you know, they're coming at a time when there are huge wind turbines now being deployed. The uh, big wind park off the UK, which is being built at the moment in the Dogger Bank, is 3.6 gigawatts. Now, for, for people who are uninitiated, a gigawatt is roughly the output of a nuclear power plant. So 3.6 gigawatts, roughly three and a half nuclear reactors. At the same time that this is being deployed, and it'll take, you know, three, four years to full com come fully online. At the same time it's being deployed, you've got Hinkley C, which is a nuclear power plant being developed at the moment in the UK. It's been on the books for development uh, since about 2000. Five, I want to say it might be a little later, it might be 2008, but it's that kind of ballpark. Mm -hmm. They're hoping now optimistically that it'll start generating electricity by 2030. So you're looking at 20 years to roll out a 3.5 mm -hmm. gigawatt nuclear plant and about four years to bring online a 3.6 Probably 10 times gigawatt. the budget. You know, and, yeah. and, and the, the, the wind one will come in on budget. It'll come in on time. Uh, it'll be, you know, as I say, three or four years for development. Uh, and the electricity coming out of it will be far cheaper than the electricity coming out of the nuclear plant if that ever does come online. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I'm not against nuclear. I, I'm not, you know, I don't have any great philosophical objections to nuclear. Uh, but it doesn't scale. Sure. And that might sound weird, but it doesn't scale. You know, it takes 20 years to build a nuclear power plant, which outputs 3.5 gigawatts. It takes three to four years to build a wind park, which outputs the same amount of electricity uh, at, at a fraction of the price. Uh, so, you know, wind and solar scale enormously. And as they are rolled out, their price drops even more. The next wind park will be cheaper again, and the next wind park will be cheaper again. And so we're, that's going to keep happening. As I said, it's dropped about the, the wind park, the wind energy price has dropped about 50% in the same time it took the solar to drop 89%. And that, like I said, that's going to keep going. The, the newer wind turbines, the ones in that Dogger Park, Dogger Bank uh, wind farm, are the uh, GE Heliod X wind turbines. These output 12 megawatts each. Now, that's incredible. 
uh, for context, you know, 10 years ago, a wind turbine was outputting 500k to one megawatt, depending on the size. Now it's 12 megawatts. Mm -hmm. And what's the advantage of putting in a 12 megawatt wind turbine? Well, it's bigger. That's the first thing. Physically, it's bigger, taller. So it gets more wind. So it's turning more of the time, generating electricity more of the time. So it's got a greater capacity factor. The amount of time it's generating electricity is greater, even in lower winds. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you could you could stick one 12 megawatt wind turbine out there or 12 one megawatt wind turbines out there. If you put 12 of them out there, that's 12 installations. That's 12 wind turbines to be maintained. You put one of them out there, it's one installation, one maintenance. So it's, it's a lot cheaper to install and to maintain a single 12 megawatt one than 12 one megawatt ones, obviously. Cool. So you're, that, again, it helps you bring down your costs. So it's bringing down costs enormously. It's increasing the amount of electricity being generated by the wind turbines. So, again, bringing down the costs even more. It's mm -hmm. a double whammy. So wind is, is dropping all the time. So wind and solar are the future. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're variable generators, so it will require storage of some kind. Uh, and there's phenomenal news in the storage space as well. There's enormous resources going in to study that uh, and great outputs as a result. The cost of lithium-ion batteries has fallen something like 95% in the last 10 years. So again, and it's down to the same things. So the economics are all in favor of renewables plus storage for electricity generation. Uh, in a lot of places now, the combination of renewables plus storage is actually cheaper than uh, gas or coal mm -hmm. or any of the fossil fuels. So, and, and again, that's starting at the equator and working north and south from there mm. for, this, for similar reasons. Um, we're seeing, because of this, we are seeing mega scale projects being announced. Uh, India announced recently that it was going to build a 35 gigawatt renewable park and so that's you know that's 10 times the size of Hinkley C you know it's 10 nuclear reactors sorry no it's not it's 30 nuclear reactors worth of generation coming from a combination of wind and solar and storage all in the same park mm. you know phenomenal stuff there's a there's a a Sun Cable, I think, is the name of the big one that's being announced in the Northern Territories in Australia. It's something like uh, 10 megawatts of solar and 20, sorry, 10 gigawatts of solar and 20 gigawatts of storage. And the idea there is that uh, there's going to be a cable drawn, you know, from that to power the city of Darwin and another cable drawn three and a half thousand kilometers north to power Singapore. You know, I mean, the scale of these projects is unimaginable. Nothing like this has been done in history before. And it's only possible to do things like this now because the costs yep. have come down so much. So there is no future, to get back to your <laughs> original uh, quote, the, the oil age, fossil fuel age is over. Mm -hmm. And it's based not on climate concerns. It's based on simple economics, sure. which, of course, means it's actually sustainable. It's financially sustainable because... No one is. And it, there, there are lots of other factors involved as well. There's this big movement towards ESGs in industry, uh, which are underlining this as well. Um, and and uh, you asked another question. You asked why, um, why, are, why is there still a, a, an oil and gas business? And I, I can understand why that's still there. That's still there because, you know, there is still people who drive cars, there are still companies burning gas, and it's going to take a long time for that to work its way out of the system. On the other hand, a different question, which I think it, I, I don't have a good answer to, and I, 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 I scratch my head all the time when I, when I consider this question, and the question is, why is there an oil and gas exploration business still? Mm. Mm. That makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. Uh, and why do I say that? Um, well, there's a concept called a carbon budget. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or if your listeners are familiar with it. Basically, the carbon budget says we have agreed as a planet back in 2015 at the Paris Climate Accord, we've agreed to try and limit global warming to one and a half degrees C or worst case, two degrees C. We're already at one. So we've 
worst case, one degree left. What does it take to get us from where we are today to that extra one degree C? Well, it turns out we have a pretty good idea. Physics tells us it's about a thousand uh, gigatons of CO2. Grab a thousand gigatons CO2, stick it up in the atmosphere, and there you go. That's we're there. Mm -hmm. We're at our extra degree C. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that. Now, what about fossil fuels? Well, here's where the problem lies. This is the real kicker. The proven reserves of the fossil fuel companies and countries, so countries are places like, you know, Saudi, Venezuela, uh, Soviet Union, not Soviet Union, now Russia. <laughs> the, the proven reserves of these companies and countries is 3,000 gigatons. So we have three times the proven reserves. And the proven reserves are what these companies use to finance loans. It's what dictates their share price. It's, you know, it's, it's what their, their value is based on. Rides of speculation. So if we can only use 1,000 of those 3,000 gigatons, that means two-thirds of their value has to be written off. Mm. That's not very palatable. And so that's why, for decades now, fossil fuel companies have been saying, okay, well, you know, let's get as many of our gigatons up into the atmosphere as we can while we still can. You know, it's, it's why uh, they have been funding uh, climate denialists. It's why they've been sowing the seeds of doubt about, you know, climate uh, change and, and global warming. Mm. Uh, that's why that's happened. Um, and if they have to write off two-thirds of their value, it has serious economic implications for them. And massive geopolitical if, in Saudi and massive Russia. Massive geopolitical, exactly. And if we already have 300% of our requirements, why are we still looking for more? All of the cheap oil and gas has already been found. So... Now, the exploration companies or organizations are looking for the marginal stuff, mm -hmm. which is more expensive to extract. That, that, that makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. In a world where the demand for their product is dwindling already, sure. we hit peak oil back in 2017, 2018. So demand is, is falling off. Uh, the what they already have we can only use one third of why is there an oil and gas exploration business mm -hmm. or industry why that makes zero sense yeah well i mean tom you, you, you didn't disappoint with the extremely optimistic green worldview i really really <laughs> love it but there are a couple of things there that um that really scream out to me for example okay if it is the case that the uh, cost per unit of energy for say solar and wind is more economically viable than the cost per unit of say gas from fracking or um, oil in a combustible engine then you would um, you would presume you would hope might be naive to presume but you would think that the um, economic machine is going to correct those mechanisms and it would be the case that say an electric car might come down into the twenty thousand dollar range or it might be the case um take in agriculture which is responsible for like 30 to 50 percent of all the co2 emissions that all of the inputs in the agriculture business might be able to transition into these other lower cost per unit renewable energies um, so I just want to, um, I would, I'd like you to say why or how it is the case that a cost per unit of solar or cost per unit of wind is cheaper than oil, but nonetheless, the price mechanism hasn't corrected that. But then also, I mean, we're still making far more, um, combustible engine cars than we are electric cars. For example, if you just take something that we interact with on an everyday level because it has to come back to the individual. And I did make some, some other notes as well, but I'll just keep it tidy and, and ask you that for now. Sure. Um, so there's a little bit to unpack there. Uh, let's see. The cost of EVs, for example, 
uh, is coming down. It's coming down year on year. Um, uh, but it, it, it's it's uh, and it's it's so the the main cost of an electric vehicle is the cost of the battery. And the cost of batteries, as I said, has fallen enormously in the last 10 years, 90 to 95 percent. So uh, why haven't EVs fallen that much? Well, they kind of have. Uh, um, but like I say, it's complicated. Why is it complicated? Well, an example I like to use is the Renault Zoe. When the Renault Zoe launched in... I, and. I, I stand to be correct on this, but if I remember correctly, it launched in around 2012. And when it launched in 2012, it had a, a 20 kilowatt hour battery capable of bringing it about 100 kilometers mm. ballpark. They launched a version two in 2016. It had a roughly 40 kilowatt hour battery capable of bringing it around 250 kilometers. And then version three launched in 2020 with a 52 kilowatt hour battery capable of bringing it 400 kilometers. So it's doubling. The 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 interesting thing there is, yeah, it's 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 pretty much doubling. The but what's interesting is the price didn't change. So the price of the vehicle stayed roughly the same, even though they went from 20 kilowatt hour battery to 52. Mm. And range went accordingly from about 100, 150, I think it was, to 400 now. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why the electric vehicles haven't come down enormously in price. It's because they've increased other things within them, like the size of the battery and the range. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about the, the, the Zoe is while the range went up and while the battery uh, capacity went up, the physical battery size stayed the same. Mm -hmm. They're still using the same battery housing that originally could only take 20 kilowatt hours and now can take 52. And that's because the energy density of batteries has increased threefold in the same time. So, but now we're hitting a kind of a sweet spot with uh, batteries in cars. Most, uh, most cars now launching today have a range in their batteries of uh, in the kind of three to 500 kilometer range. Uh, whereas a few years ago it would have been 150 to 250 to maybe 300, but now it's closer to four to 500. So, and the, the, the prices are still dropping year on year on year for the batteries. Mm. So because we've hit that kind of sweet spot of range, I don't think that range is going to go to 600 to 700 to 800 to 900 to 1000. I think the manufacturers are going to keep it around the four to 500. And then we'll start to see the prices fall because they're not adding more range. They're not adding more batteries and they can take advantage of the falling costs of the batteries to now lower the cost of the vehicles. Mm. So while it hasn't come uh, in, it hasn't really visibly come so far because there's been they've been using the, the, the falling prices to increase the range. Sure. Um, there still are uh, quite affordable small electric cars uh, in the kind of uh, 10 to 20 to 30 thousand euro range. Uh, they're small city cars. The E-Up, for example, from Volkswagen is one. And there's a couple of variants of that under the Seat brand and the Skoda brand. Uh, there's the uh, Citroen Ami, the Renault Tweezy, you know, which are small little, uh, they're almost toy cars. <laughs> Um, there's, uh, but lovely zippy little city cars mm -hmm. and zero emissions are great, great fun. Uh, there's, there's a few more, um, and there's the Honda E, there's lots of the, the, the smaller city ones. So that range, and by range in this case, I mean range of models as opposed to autonomy, that range is only getting bigger. Yep. And there's a, there's a number of things behind that. A lot of it is down to economics, but a lot of it is also down to regulations, mm -hmm. uh, city regulations and country regulations around what vehicles you can get, you can drive into cities uh, is getting tighter and tighter in terms of emissions. Uh, you know, you're seeing things like the ultra low emissions zone in London, uh, lots of cities, about 400 low emission zones in Europe now today, uh, which say that if you are driving an older car that is that does have emissions, you have to pay X amount uh, to enter the city zone. And, you know, that's having huge implications for air quality in cities. Yeah. Only beneficial. So really positive stuff.
did uh, did I answer all of your question there? Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely um, answered the electric vehicle question, and the question I I asked as well uh, wasn't really fairly. Um, um, asked just because I sort of said, well, why hasn't the price mechanism connected everything? And then as he was speaking, I started realizing that there is, it's too complex of a web. If you just take EVs, for example, you need the infrastructure in people's homes to be able to click into the wall. You need the infrastructure in the car parks to be able to click into the car park. If you have the incentive then and to then go buy an electric vehicle. But something else that I'm thinking of as well is, is, is what about the scale of these renewables? Because for example, you mentioned the 12 gigawatt, um, um, wind farm off the coast of England, which produces an enormous amount of energy. But the real crucial thing is how was that energy then captured, right? And then can I, can I in here in Stockholm, can I consume that energy um, that is maybe made down in Malmo, which has, it's like a, I don't know, 300 kilometer driveway. That's a massive wind farm in Sweden. Or like, uh, th this is also just something I don't have any knowledge on as well. So um, like, sure. how does the renewable energy when it's created how is it then captured and then transferred because that whole cycle has to then be more cost efficient than say i just put oil into my car and then as i go it's being transferred you know what i mean so rather than just the kind energy of, as let, let me let me let me roll back to evs for a second before we go into the renewables because there's, there's a couple of things i forgot to mention um and one of them was uh Last September, Tesla held what call, what it called its battery day, where it had a series of announcements around its batteries and showed how in the coming three, four years, it's going to reduce the cost of its batteries by 53%. So right there, we're seeing a huge reduction in costs. And yesterday, uh, today we're recording this, it's Tuesday the 16th of March. So yesterday, Monday the 15th, uh, Volkswagen had their power day where they announced that they're going to roll out six gigafactories globally. Uh, now, the gigafactory that Tesla have in Nevada is a 35 gig, uh, gigawatt hour rated plant. So it can produce 35 gigawatt hours of batteries per year. Uh, Volkswagen talked about producing six 40 gigawatt hour battery plants to cope with the demand it sees mm -hmm. for electric mm -hmm. vehicles globally so that it won't be caught short, uh, that it'll have the supply chain of batteries it requires. So, and they say that doing this and a number of other um, innovations that they talked about in their battery production processes will bring the cost of their batteries down around 50% as well. So again, battery costs are going to keep coming down. So sorry, that was just going back to the previous discussion. Now, renewables. So your, your question is, uh, so and, and a correction there as well, when you mentioned the wind farm uh, off the coast of England, the Dogger Bank one, it's a, th it's a 3.6 gigawatt uh, plant, uh, and those gigawatts are being produced by those 12 megawatt wind turbines, megawatt. that's where the 12 came from. Um, so the electricity from that, I mean, electricity, as soon as it's uh, produced, is consumed, uh, or else it's stored in a battery somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's rarely, there's, there's very little long-term storage for electricity. So you generally try and have demand and supply uh, meet each other pretty much. Uh, you, know, you, you, try and, you try and balance the supply and demand as, as close as possible. And you, you can tweak it slightly using uh, adjustments to the way that the, the, the system um, balances. Uh, you change the frequency of the, the electricity on the system. Uh, so... Um, yeah, as as the you, you just change the amount of renewables, you increase the amount of renewables to increase to, to match the increasing demand, and then you are at the same time taking out the traditional generators uh, because they're based on coal and gas and things of like that. So you reduce the amount of those in the system. You add in increasing the uh, renewables, and that's how you meet your demand. Um, you talked about a three hundred kilometer distance between where you are in Stockholm and Malmo, a wind farm. I think you said it was. I mean, that's trivial. Um, as I said, they're they're talking in northern Australia about sending the electricity three and a half thousand kilometers uh, from the northern territories yeah. to Singapore. And they're using a, a technology called HVDC, which is high voltage DC, uh, which is I won't say the lossless, but the losses in transmission are about the order of five to six percent, which is typical for transmission rate losses in any kind of scenario. Typical grid losses from transmission come in around five to six percent, no matter what the technology used. Okay, so uh, taking into account the uh, worldview that you've uh, laid out here, 
what in your estimation are the least likely things to transpire, whether that just be because of, you know, cultural influence, political influence, um, and, and so forth, because obviously there's like the ideal scenario of if everything goes according to plan and then there's the realistic scenario. And I just want to ask you what you see the sort of, um, how things might play out. Sure. Well, I mean, the least likely scenario is that we get a revival of coal. Um, so <laughs> that's just not going to, yeah, happen. I think we're past those days, uh, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, long past. Uh, so the what's the most what's the most likely thing to happen? The, the most likely thing to happen is that we accelerate the path we're on already, and we need to. I mean, we're adding lots more renewables to the system, and that's great. But we need to increase that enormously between now and 2030, and between now and 2050 by orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. We need to essentially electrify everything, and make sure that the electricity that's electrifying everything is fully renewable. Yep. And you mentioned agriculture as well. Uh, agriculture has a number of significant issues. It's not just the, the inputs. Well, it is. Uh, it, it's the inputs and the outputs. But one of the inputs that we don't consider in agriculture very often is land use. Mm -hmm. The land use in agriculture is unconscionable. Uh, we have robbed enormous swathes of land from biodiversity to create food for us to eat yeah. and uh, food for our food and yeah yeah, yeah it, it, exactly so we're yeah to, to your point we're growing plants to feed animals mm -hmm. so that they'll produce protein so that we can consume the protein whereas we could get it directly from the plants cut out the middleman mm -hmm. and avoid the cruelty and the land use so i mean i, I did a couple of podcasts around that uh, on my climate 21 podcast uh, where i talked to a guy who's doing a big uh, building one of the world's biggest uh, indoor vertical farms and uh, mark corzilius and you know we talked about that the big indoor vertical farms can uh, can create in a thousand square meters of indoor vertical farm the same amount of food as would be produced on an eighteen thousand meter uh, farm. such an amazing innovation it's traditional farm yeah. yeah so you know it's 18 times uh the the reduction in land use so 95 percent uh, so phenomenal stuff and I, I spoke also then to impossible foods mm -hmm. who are creating you know meat from plants uh just you know cutting out the middleman and doing the, the synthesis of the protein um, uh, using plant protein to, to, to produce mm -hmm. meat and that was phenomenal as well and of course the idea of not having massive amounts of land dedicated to grazing animals, things like cows. I mean, we spend the, the, in, the inputs in cows, apart from just the land, is the, the, the sun and the grass and the, the water over the lifetime of the animal, you know, eating grass or eating soy or whatever we're feeding them. Uh, uh, roughly 3% of the protein that it goes in to make a cow actually is consumed by us. 3%. You know, just unbelievable waste. And that's because, you know, the cow was doing things like, you know, uh, producing hide, producing bones, producing teeth, producing eyes, stuff we never consume. Mm. Uh, and it's doing it over its lifetime. It's excreting, you know, for three, four years before it's slaughtered. Uh, the, the amount of water it consumes in that time as well is, you know, incredible. Water numbers are insane. Whereas, yeah. yeah, they are, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's the most inefficient, one of the most inefficient, if not the most inefficient system we have. So if we, you know, change to huge indoor vertical farms and if we change to plant-based meat products, we can hugely reduce the inputs going into our food production system and give back to nature the enormous swathes of land we have taken from mm -hmm. it to produce the food we, we consume today and you know return those to things like biodiversity and return them to reforestation and return them to then carbon sequestration which could help mitigate or re reverse some of the carbon issues we're seeing today mm -hmm. but what is something within your worldview that you are afraid isn't going to pan out the way it does like for example if we talk about um, impossible foods and indoor vertical farming that's something that i uh would like, but I'm not so optimistic about just because of the role that agriculture plays culturally all around the world. You know, you can't just like remove it so simply. No, it's not going to be simple, uh, but it will happen in time because it's the right thing to do. You know, uh, very much uh, as a species, we do the right thing 
eventually. You know, it, it, it takes us a while and we get a few missteps along the way. Yeah. So maybe it won't be beyond meat or maybe it won't be impossible mm-hmm. foods. Maybe it'll be a successor company that comes along, but we'll get there eventually because we have to. Mm-hmm. We don't have a choice in that. Uh, so, you know, that is the future of food production because it has to be. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, look, let's get one really quick one in here, uh, an exciting one. What is the most exciting innovation that you see as a futurist that's already in um, production? Whoa, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think there are some that have great potential. Uh, of the ones that have great potential but are not in production yet or are just starting to be in production, kind of, sort of, I think quantum computers have an enormous potential to for, for good. Um, whether that's realized, I think it will be uh, because we're a lot of the way there. There's still a few problems to be ironed out before they're done at scale. Yeah. So uh, they have huge, huge potential because they can solve lots of really big problems, uh, problems that traditional computers find it really hard to solve. So I think they're, they have a huge future. Something else is energy storage. Particularly, I, I mean, I talked about lithium ion batteries mm-hmm. and they're great. They can store hours at, sorry, they can store energy uh, at grid scale for several hours, which is fantastic, but they're still not at the point from a price perspective, really, uh, they're still not at the point where they can store energy for several days or several months, yep. for example. Uh, days is the most important, really. Uh, so we need a new technology to come along for energy storage, which would allow us to economically store energy for a few days at mm-hmm. a time. Uh, there, there's, people are working on things like compressed air storage, uh, liquid air, essentially, where you compress air to the point where it's actually a liquid and it's just standard air, the stuff we breathe. Really? So, wow. you know, there's nothing, nothing exotic okay. about it, but you compress it, you compress it, put it under pressure, it turns into a liquid, you store it in tanks, and then, you know, you release it from the tank, spin it through a turbine, and there you've got electricity. Wow. So, boom. Uh, you know, th- there's lots of interesting things happening there. Sure. Uh, it, it, it sounds almost low tech, uh, but it does, does it? probably yeah. other things. Yeah, yeah, you know, really simple mm-hmm. stuff. Um, simple stuff at, you know, at, at our remove, you know, but obviously there's a lot yeah. of tech going into making it happen. So there there will be some phenomenal things come up in the world of energy storage, which will contribute enormously yeah. to this space. Um, we're just not there yet, I, I, but we'll get there. I was looking at something during the week about the potential of geothermal energy. And the, when it was explained, I had the reaction of, man, this does not sound like a complicated thing um, because they were talking about mm-hmm. this giant piece of quartz under Mexico. It's about 15 to 20 kilometers deep. If we could just drill into it, pump high pressure water in, then it will create the steam to turn a turbine. And then there you go. We've got electricity. And then so supposedly this piece of quartz um, could produce the world's energy, which um, which is again, the, the sort of um, cynical, skeptical mind of me, I start thinking, okay, is it yeah. going to produce the world's energy or is it going to produce some? Yeah. But like, that's another innovation which could just totally change the entire way we look at the world. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of great things happening in geothermal. I mean, I, I read an article about Kenya recently. Uh, it was, I think it was on the BBC website and how Kenya are doing great stuff with geothermal. But of course, they're in the Rift Valley, so they're ideally placed for that because it's a volcanically active zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, there's a couple of issues with geothermal because pumping high pressure water down underground, the return water or steam tends to come up with some nasty chemicals in ah, it, sure. uh, for example. Uh, so um, geothermal also has a big upfront capital cost. So geothermal energy typically is not cheap. And for the example you mentioned, let's say that we could uh, get over the issues of the high pressure water, get over the capital cost in Mexico. Uh, and, and do it. How do you get the electricity from Mexico to, you know, China mm-hmm. or to here in Spain or, you know, uh, it, it's not an insurmountable problem mm-hmm. uh, and it would be great for Mexico, but it'd be true for, think that's for my Mexicans. All right. But that, so yeah. then it, um, it makes th- th- that, that kind of elucidates a little bit in my mind. Like the, what we need is, is located energy being produced everywhere and that's why the sun is everywhere mostly in the equator but then wind is also everywhere and so if you have the technology yeah. done right it can be produ- reproduced many different times around the world um what i what i always say is the wind is always blowing and the sun is always shining mm-hmm. somewhere so if you have a large 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 super grid mm-hmm. you can move those electrons around and if the sun stops shining then we've got much bigger issues <laughs> 
exactly. Um, look, uh, Tom, I you know I know you know this, but I I had a lot more questions that I would really like to ask you, but I'm <laughs> conscious of the time, so I'm just going to ask one more, and that is, what country are you most bullish on as you look into the future? Um, I think China. Uh, I think China has a huge possibility, if not probability, to change things globally. Uh, they're making massive investments into EVs. They're making massive investments into renewables. They're shutting down a lot of their coal plants. Uh, their aim uh, is to get to net zero as a nation by 2060, mm -hmm. which is about 10 years too late, but still it's, it's pretty impressive. They want to have their emissions peak in 2030. To get there, they're going to have to bring on you know, hundreds of gigawatts of new renewable sources every year between now and 2030, and then after that between 2030 and 2060. Uh, they brought on uh, 72, no, 80, around 80 gigawatts of new solar last year in 2020, and about 50 gigawatts of new wind uh, you know, so they're they're on the right path, and they have put out a mandate to all districts that forty percent of their energy needs to come in the future from renewables. So, you know, when you think of China building out hundreds of gigawatts of solar and wind every year for the next number of decades, mm -hmm. what's that going to do to the cost of solar and wind globally? You know, through the experience curve, through the learning curve, it's going to drop it and drop it and drop it. So, you know, we will have vast resources of cheap power thanks to China. Mm -hmm. And there's no consideration of perhaps whether um, the numbers and figures and narrative that China is telling the rest of the world isn't inflated. Like, obviously, it's taken with a pinch of salt, but do we need maybe a much larger dose of salt in the case of China? Like, is that same message that was delivered? From I don't European think so, Union? because China have been putting out these five-year plans, you know, for the last number of decades. Uh, and they've been announcing in these five-year plans the number of renewables they're going to deploy and their targets for those. And typically by year three, they've blown through the targets. So um, they, 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 their, their record in the renewables space uh, exceeds everyone else's. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's actually, um, I, I totally agree with you. I have read a lot about the, the Chinese uh, um, solar farms there, you know, putting in the... Mm. And so it could, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is good for the world for renewable energy, but then you have to wonder like, yep. oh, do, do we really want China to be the ones that like take this <laughs> great new power when they do take, um, when they do scale the, yeah. their renewable energy to a certain point? Anyone else could have gone down that path as well, and China chose to be the ones to yeah. do it. Well, um, look, Tom, thank you so much for giving me an hour of your morning. Uh, you know, I'd love to speak to you more about maybe European specific uh, energy response at one stage, but uh, definitely for sure. another day. Sure. Thanks for inviting me, Ryan. Thank you, mate. And you, uh, yeah, very generous with your time. Enjoy Sevilla, and uh, we'll see you later. See you, Ryan. Good luck. Thanks, mate.